Last weekend we talked about how this is to be a house of prayer. That's what Jesus said about his house. Because it's a place to encounter him. This isn't a place of preaching or worship or children's ministry. First and foremost, first of all, it's a place to encounter God. We want to do that today in all sorts of different ways. But one of those is to pray. And we've had a rough week as a country, haven't we? And we need to come before our Lord and, and just to get settled up a little bit in the side of our hearts with all the troubling things that have happened this week. And so would you join me, please, in prayer? Lord, this week has been difficult as we've watched. We've watched a, a, a bunch of buildings collapse in Texas and Waco and people die. We've watched bombs go off in Boston and a manhunt. And people killed and, and maimed and injured. Lord, we are so reminded that there is a battle between evil and good. Lord, when it comes to these kind of things and this attack in Boston, we, Lord, we ask that you would help us forgive. You tell us that if we forgive others, that you will forgive us. And it's so easy to get angry and to hold that bitterness. Lord, help us to love and to forgive. When Jesus was on the cross, to those who had harmed him, to those who had put him on that cross, to those who hurled insults at him, Jesus, your response was, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Lord, may we forgive. Lord, for those who are here in this room today who need encouragement, they need encouragement from you. They need to know that you're there. They need to know that you love them. They need to know that, that you have a future for them. Lord, may they sense your presence in their life today. Lord, we come here to encounter you. We come here to spend time with, with you, to worship you, to learn about you, to be with other people who love you. This is your day. And we give it to you. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may have a seat. Thank you, Brian. And if you would, take your Bible and turn it to Luke chapter 20. The Gospel of Luke to chapter 20. If you didn't bring a Bible, we have Bibles provided. You could take that and turn it to chapter 20, page 879. And also, if you don't own a Bible, we really want you to have that. We want you to take it home with you. Every once in a while, I'll have somebody on staff say, you know, we, we found uh, Bibles that are less expensive, not quite as nice, but they're cheaper, a little better for the budget. And I always say, no, I want the nice Bibles, because I want people to take a nice Bible home. So really, we mean it. Take that Bible if you don't have one. We want you to have it. We want you to, to read it. We are now, as we're in chapter 20 of the Gospel of Luke, we, we are now in the, literally the final days of Jesus' life before he is arrested and tried and then brought to the cross. And things are heating up. I mean, things are getting hot in a big way. If you remember, we looked at that Jesus went into the temple and he turned over the tables of the merchants. We looked at that last weekend. The weekend before, we saw that he had anguish. He looked over Jerusalem and particularly over the Temple Mount area, no doubt. And he had anguish over the spiritual condition of his people. And then he went into the temple and he turned over the tables of the merchants and the money changers because they, were, they brought a secular heart to a sacred place. And the religious leaders are beyond angry with Jesus as he went into the temple to do this. Now there's a group of individuals, when you make them together, they're called the Sanhedrin. They're the ruling body of the Jews. They're out to not just discredit Jesus. They're not just out to arrest Jesus. They are out to destroy Jesus. We see that in the end of, of chapter 19, verses 47 and 48, that the religious leaders are out to destroy Jesus, but they have a problem on their hands. The problem is, is the people. Jesus is incredibly popular with the people. Jesus has healed the people, so they love him. He's taught them wisdom that they never heard before, and they love that. They, he has shown them love, and they love him for that. And so there's these big crowds, and Jesus is now teaching in the temple with all these crowds, people listening to his every word. 
So these religious leaders, these groups, people from the Sanhedrin, are going to now into the temple and trying to trap him up with his own words, trying to get him to discredit himself, say something that's blasphemous so that they can arrest him in front of everybody so everybody will know, yes, Jesus said these things and he, he incriminated himself. And then they're going to arrest him and they're going to try him and they're going to put him on a cross. That's the intent as we walk into this passage that we look at here. Let's look at it beginning in chapter 20, verse, <clears throat> verse 1. And one day, as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel, the chief priests and the scribes with the elders, those are the groups that make up the Sanhedrin, came up and said to him, tell us by what authority you do these things or who it is that gave you this authority. Stop right there. You see, the Sanhedrin strongly believed that they were in charge of the temple. They believed that they were the authority. And if Jesus answers, um, you know, well, God is the authority, they're going to claim blasphemy. And if he says, well, I did this on my own authority, they're going to say, no, you didn't have authority. We didn't give you that authority. So Jesus is between a rock and a hard place with the question, if he's going to answer it truthfully, but he's not yet ready to be arrested. He's not yet ready to go to the cross. It's not quite time, almost a few days away, but he's not ready yet. He's got a little bit more business to do. So what does he do? How does he respond? He asks a question in response to the question and puts them on the defensive. Verse 3, he answered them, I also will ask you a question. Now tell me, was the baptism of John, John the Baptist, from heaven or from man? And then the gospel writer Luke gives us an insight to a sidebar that these religious leaders had with regards to this question because it's also a difficult question for them. And he, and he explains it here. Verse 5. And they discussed it with one another saying, If we say from heaven that John's baptism is from heaven, he will say, Why did you not believe him? But if we say from man, all the people will stone us to death for they are convinced that John was a prophet. So get that? So John the Baptist comes and he does this baptism of repentance to get people to be, be prepared to meet the Messiah, Jesus. And Jesus asks the, the Sanhedrin, uh, you know, who's, where did John's baptism come from? Because they didn't follow John's baptism. And if they said from heaven, then he's going to say, well, then why didn't you follow him and his teachings? And if they say it's not from heaven, the people are going to be really mad who are all around there. Because they believe him to be a true prophet of God, which he was. So what do they do? Verse 7. So they answered that they did not know where it, his baptism came from. That's called punting. <laughs> they had certainly a very strong opinion that they believed that John the Baptist was not from God. But they weren't going to say that in front of the people. And so they punt. You know, don't mess around with a debate with Jesus. The, the God of the universe, with all wisdom and knowledge, a debate you're going to lose every time. But we do it all the time, don't we? We debate, Jesus, uh, I don't think this should be the way it should be. I don't like how your word says this. I think I'll do this instead. Uh, uh, we pray to him and we, we tell him exactly how he should do it. But they, for the first time maybe ever in their leadership, said, we don't know. So how does he respond to that? Look at verse 8. Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. You're not going to tell me? I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> He's so wise. Wouldn't you love to have been there and seen how this all played out? He's so wise. Now, what kind of authority did he have over the temple? All authority. It's his house. In fact, we learn at the end of the book of Matthew, when Jesus has already died, uh, buried, been risen from the dead, and now he's giving the last words to his disciples before he ascends. He gives them the Great Commission. And he starts off the Great Commission by saying, all authority has been given to me on heaven and on earth. Now go make disciples. He's got total authority, and he could have told them that, but he wasn't ready to be arrested yet, and so he was very careful and crafty in how he did things because he can be that way because he is God. 
But he's not done with these religious leaders, like he never is. And he tells now a parable to the people that are there at the temple, with the religious leaders there. And he tells this parable, a parable is a story, to make a point, as he's going to confront these religious leaders by making a point through this story. Now, you need to know this about this story. It was very uh, normal in those days for a landowner to have, let's say, like a vineyard, which we're going to see in this story, a vineyard, that the landowner prepared the vineyard, got it all set up, and then turned it over to a tenant farmers. And in order to be able to keep the land, the tenant farmer would have to give back to the owner a portion of, in this case, grapes or wine, a quarter of that or half of that, whatever they work out contractually, and then they get to keep the rest and get the profit from it and live on the land. So that's what is going on here. So they would have known all about this kind of a, of a setup. Verse 9 of chapter 20. And Jesus began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and let it out to tenants and went into another country for a long while. While the time came, he, he sent, when the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. This is at the harvest time. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent another servant. But they also beat and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent yet a third. This one also they wounded and cast out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance may be ours. Due to maybe the, the laws of that day or whatever, if, if that happened, maybe they would have thought it would have been theirs. So they, they, they throw him out, verse 15, of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Now let's understand the story by looking at who the characters are of the story. The, the owner of the vineyard is God. And the, the vineyard represents the nation of Israel, the Jewish people. The tenant farmers, the one who are working the land, are the Jewish religious leaders. They're the ones who are responsible for the treatment of the servants or the prophets. It's a picture of the prophets, the servants who come to get the, the portion of the grapes or the wine from the tenant farmers. They're the prophets that God sent throughout Israel's history to get their attention. That God sent to say, hey, thus saith the Lord. That God sent to say, turn your heart back to God and come and be back with me as my people. The son that was sent is Jesus, who was sent and died on behalf of our sin as the people rejected him and put him on a cross. As Jesus tells the story, it's looking back to the history of, of Israel, but also looking forward to just a few days from now when he will be put on a cross. And, and then the others that we see in the last verse there, when, when the tenant farmers are evicted and destroyed, meaning they are, they are killed, that others are allowed to go into that vineyard and take it over, and that would be the Gentiles. Now, now salvation is open to, to all people through this. I mean, let's, let's put this in 2013 language. You own a home in the area and you get um, transferred by your business overseas. But you know you're going to be able to come back in two or three years and you, and you love your house, you love your neighborhood, so you don't want to sell it. So you're going to, lend, uh, you're going to lease it out, rent it out for, for that period of time. And because you're going to be overseas, you get a property management company to oversee your, your, your house so that if there's you know, problems with the house, if there's something that breaks, they can take care of it. And they are responsible to collect the, the rent for you. And so you go and, and you lease out your, your house and um, it's time for the rent and the property management company sends someone to go get the, the rent and the crazy thing happens is they you know, open the door and the guy asks for the rent. They say, you can't have the rent. Not only that, they beat him up, intimidated him. 
and send him on his way. And you get a phone call about this overseas, and, and you have obviously some options at your disposal. One of those would be call the police and evict them and get other tenants in there and maybe even have them arrested for what they've done. But for whatever reason, you have a soft heart. And you have some compassion. You say, well, you know, this is a bad day or whatever, and so I'm going to try again. Why don't you send somebody else to, to go get the rent? And, and so the property management company sends another person to go get the, the rent. And the exact same thing happens to this person. Again, you get a phone call, and, and to the property management's surprise, and probably uh, not too happy about this, you say, let's try it again. Let's just give them another chance. Third person goes, same exact thing happens. Now what do you do? And you think, man, well, my son's in town. They'll respect my son. And so you send your son. As you hear the story, you're thinking, not a good idea to send your son. But the owner says, they'll respect my son. At least they'll respect him and send your son. And they not only don't respect your son, they realize that if they, if they kill the son, who's the heir of that home, that, that possibly they'll even get to stay in that home, it'll become theirs, and so they kill him. You get word of this. You're heartbroken over this. What do you do now? Well, you call the police. You get them evicted. You get them arrested. And you press charges all the way to the full extent of the law, all the way to the death penalty for what they've done to your son. And Jesus' parable captures the historic relationship with his people. The Jews abused the prophets as they spoke of coming back to God, and then God sends his son, and they killed him. But this story also is a picture, a beautiful picture of the patience of God who pursues and pursues and pursues us to come to him, who sends person after person after person to get our attention to come to him, and eventually sends his own son out of his love for us so that we may be right with him through his son. It's a beautiful picture of a patient God. But it's also a picture of the ultimate judgment of God. Look at what happens here. Verse 16, he will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others, meaning the Gentiles. And when they heard this, they said, Surely not. But he looked directly at them and said, and I'm sure that this is the religious leaders because of what we've seen a little bit. He said, what then is that is written, that this that is written, and this is from Psalm 118. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. That's a reference to Jesus. He's the chief cornerstone. He's the very foundation stone of all belief. He's the only way to get to God. He's the only way to get to heaven. And if you reject him, you reject the, the chief cornerstone, who's also the righteous judge who one day will crush you if you do not follow him in the judgment day. You will not be allowed in heaven. You'll not be allowed to be with the Father. You will, be spent, you will spend an eternity in punishment, separated from a holy, loving God in a place called hell. And God, out of his love, sent prophet after prophet after prophet, sent his son to avoid that from happening. He's a patient God. And this parable shows the patience of God, but then the ultimate judgment of God. We need to take this very seriously. Listen to what it says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. It says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you. Why? Why is he patient? Not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. He's patient because he doesn't want anybody to be separated from him for all eternity in hell. He is patient all the way till our deathbed. But there is a judgment day. Some of you have been crying out to God because of a loved one. Maybe it's a son or daughter, a grandson or granddaughter. Or maybe it's a spouse or brother or sister or a dear friend who, who just will not turn their life over to Christ. You need to know that God is pursuing them. 
He's pursuing them, and he keeps at it. He's relentless at it. He's patient, patient, patient. But there is a day where we're all held accountable for a belief of the Son. Here's what we need to know. If you reject the Son, you reject the Father. If you reject the Son, you reject the Father. I have a 13-year-old son. If you mess with my son, you mess with me. Same with my daughters, by the way. (laughs) Same with my wife. You mess with them, you mess with me. You reject the Son of God, you reject God. A lot of people think they can hold on to God and get to heaven and reject the Son of God. It doesn't work that way. You reject the Son, you reject the Father. Well, this is going over so well with the religious leaders that they realize they got to change their tactics because... They're not getting anywhere, and they're just getting angrier. And so now they realize that still in this public setting, they, they want to trip, trip him up. They want to trap him in his own words in front of other people. So the other people will say, oh, okay, he's blasphemed. So now they, they, they quickly send spies. This is all happening in rapid fashion because they want to do this like right away. And so they send in people to look like they're followers of Jesus, but their intentions are all wrong. Look at verse 19. The scribes and the chief priests sought to lay hands on him at that very hour, for they perceived that he had told this parable against them. So they're brilliant. They figured it out. But they feared the people. Again, the people are their obstacle. So they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be sincere, that they might catch him in something he said so as to deliver him up to the authority and jurisdiction of the governor. So they asked him, these are the spies, notice this this lack of sincerity as they they, they say these words. Teacher, we know that you speak and teach rightly and show no partiality, but truly teach the way of God. Then they asked this question, is it lawful for us to give tribute to Caesar or not? But he perceived their craftiness and said to them, show me a denarius. Whose likeness and inscription does it have? They said, Caesar's. He said to them, Then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. This is a legitimate, genuine, moral dilemma for the Jews. The Roman government was a pagan government. All sorts of gods that they held on to. On top of that, they were abusive and brutal. And on top of that, they they put on high levels of exorbitant taxation on the Jewish people to the point where it put them into poverty. They hated the Roman government. To give their hard-earned money and to give it away to a government that went totally against their own beliefs was very difficult. In a sense, they're asking, do do we go with God or go with, with the government? Because to support the government with our money, when they do things with it that we are totally against, goes against our moral conscience. This was a moral dilemma for them. It was a legitimate dilemma that they bring before Jesus, although they're trying to trip him up when they do so. Maybe you felt at times that some of the ways that your hard-earned money is used by the government goes against your your, your conscience and belief, and you, you can understand that, how that feels. And so they ask him this question. And he says to them, Take out a denarius. Let me see a denarius. And a denarius was a silver coin. And it had the the image of Caesar, probably Tiberius Caesar at this time, on it. And an inscription that that, that gave him deity. Talked about him being a a god. Would go totally against Judaism. And it was worth a day's wage. So... If you're in poverty, a day's wage like matters a lot. So let's just do a little bit of easy math. So let's say you're living in this area and you make twenty five thousand a year. You're going to trouble making it. This isn't like pulling out a, a quarter and you know it's just like a little thing. 
No, it's, it's a day's wage. So if you make 25000 a year, if you do the, the general math, I'm not going to be exact, but it's about 100 bucks that this is about. This is, this is something significant. It's like 100 bucks, And and Jesus says something that probably was a bit aggravating to them, and that was give to the government what the government asks you, what's due to them, and, and give to God what is due God. Now, now what, is, what is God's? He owns what? Everything. So give a portion of, of what is God's anyway to the government. Give a portion of what you need to give to God, and the rest of it you keep for yourself. I remember when I was in high school, I finally had earned a paycheck with enough money that I actually had the government take some money out for taxes, first time. <laughs> I was driving in the car with my dad. My dad's a CPA. He's an accountant. He deals with people's taxes all the time. And I am spouting off. I am waxing eloquent. I am upset. I can't believe how much money they took from my paycheck. I worked hard for all that money. And look how much they took out. Now, I look back, I can't imagine how big that would have been for that huge paycheck for being 16 or 17 at that time. And we were driving, I'll never forget exactly where we were. We were on Foothill Boulevard in La Crescenta, California, the hometown I grew up in. My parents still live there. And, and my dad just is listening to me. And then when I kind of calmed down a little bit, he just very, very quietly said, So, son, do you like the street we're driving on right now? I'm like, yeah, I guess. It's fine. Do you like the, the high school you go to? Yeah, I like it. Are, are you glad that we have, like a, the police, we have a police department and a fire department to protect us and watch out for us? Yeah. Are you glad that we have a military to protect us? Yeah. He said, son, how do you think that gets paid for? I'm like, oh. <laughs> in Romans chapter 13, it says that we are to show respect to those in government authorities because they are there for our protection and help. Book of Romans. Roman government, pagan government, instructions there. We respect those in authority. So what happens? What do these spies do now? Look at verse 26. And they were not able, in the presence of the people... To catch him in what he said. But marveling at his answer, they became silent. Don't debate with Jesus, you're going to lose. <laughs> Remember that. They were marveling at his wisdom and they thought, hmm? We're not going to say anything more. I want to share with you, uh, before I close the sermon and we get to the Lord's Supper, something that God just put on my heart this week when it comes to this message. And that's what's pictured in the parable of the tenants, the wicked tenants, about the patience of God. The patience of God. That he's relentless in seeking after us. He's relentless in showing us his love. He's relentless in those days of bringing prophet after prophet after prophet and eventually his son. He's still going after us. Uh, a few weeks back, I was on an airplane. I was coming back from the East Coast. And when I got to my seat, I was in the aisle. There was a guy about age 18 to 20 on the window seat. And nobody was in the middle. And nobody came to the middle. It's the first time in a long time I've not been on a flight. Or I didn't have somebody right next to me. And, and the, the guy next to the window, uh, who's 18, 19, 20, he had uh, earbuds and headphones on. And, and he was looking out the window. We just did a quick like little head high as I sat down. 
And, and then his music was cranking. I mean, I could hear it well. I almost wanted to be like a dad. Dude, don't you know that's going to blow out your eardrums? But I, I didn't do it. And it was so loud. I mean, it was just like this heavy beat, heavy metal type stuff just for, for the longest time. And uh, I got out my, my Bible after we, we got up, and uh, I got a pad of paper. I was working on my sermon. And for a few hours, we were just like that for, out, for several hours. And, and then a flight attendant came by, um, and she was asking people, would you like coffee? You know, sometimes they come with just a tray of coffee and nothing else. And I, I wasn't looking up, and I'm not a coffee drinker, and so I wasn't really interested. But all of a sudden, I felt coffee. On my arm, on my hand, on my left leg. But it alarmed me because it was on my Bible. And I went, because, <gasps> you know, I don't want to say my Bible. And right away she's like, oh, I'm so sorry. And she gave me some napkins. And I, and I quickly got my Bible first. And then I worried about myself second. And there's a little tiny stain in there. It's, it's just fine. <laughs> and uh, she apologized three different times. I'm like, it's fine. It's okay. The guy sitting next to me after she left pulls his ear uh, buds out and he says, so how's your Bible? It, it, that's a Bible, right? I said, yeah, that's, that's a Bible. I said, it's okay. It's fine. He said, so what are you? <laughs> and I'm like, he goes, what religion are you? I said, oh, I'm a, I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus. He goes, oh. I said, so what are you? He said, well, um, I was a Jehovah's Witness, but not, not anymore. I said, oh. He goes, my, my family, they're Jehovah's Witness. I said, oh, so your mom and dad are Jehovah's Witness? He goes, well, they were, but they're not anymore either, but the rest of my family is. He said, we're, we're kind of searching right now. Huh. <laughs> and so we had this conversation about searching. And I commended him for searching and talked about how you could search and who you could search about and all that. And, and then he put his earbuds back in and the music started cranking again and we landed and then he got on another plane to go to Idaho and I went home because he lives in Idaho. And I don't know if I'll ever see this guy again. Chances are small. I hope I'll see him in eternity because I just have to think that here God had a guy who was searching next to a follower of Jesus with a Bible out. The curiosity of the guy is up. And it's like he said to the flight attendant, go stand over here. And then he bumped her. <laughs> to spill coffee on my Bible. So that one day, maybe 20 years from now, I'll be sitting in some room and this guy will be given a testimony. He's about 40 years old, 20 years from now. And he's given a testimony. He goes, it was the strangest thing. I left the Jehovah's Witness faith I didn't really know what to do. I started to have these amazing encounters with people along the road. I even had one with this guy on an airplane. He got his coffee spilled on his Bible. I'm like, that's me! <laughs> and God pursued me, pursued me, pursued me. Until one day I finally gave my life to him. That's what he does. He pursues us and pursues us and pursues us. But you got to understand, once you die, no more pursuit. It's over. You must make the decision while you're here on this earth. And if you reject the Son, you reject the Father. If you reject the Son, you reject the Father. If you die without the Son, you die without the Father. Listen to what the Gospel writer John writes. This is Jesus talking. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. John 5. Jesus said in John chapter 8, they said to him, therefore, where is your Father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my Father. If you knew me, you would know my Father also. John chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. To which they picked up stones after that to kill him because he claimed to be God. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 23, John writes, No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. He writes in chapter 4, Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. If you're going to get the Father, you've got to go through the Son. 
There's no other way. That's why Christianity claims only through Jesus can one be saved. Only through his work on the cross can we have the forgiveness of sins. It's all about the Son that leads us to the Father. Have you received the Son? Well, here's another chance that God's put in your way to receive his Son. And I'm going to say a prayer to lead us into the presence of God. Prayer is just a conversation with God. For you to have the opportunity right here, right now, to receive the Son. If you're a believer in Christ, I ask you to pray right now for God's Spirit to move. And for all of us, let's bow, if you would, in a word of prayer. And if you have never received the Son, I invite you to do that. God is calling you. This is not my invitation. This is God's invitation. As he tries to get your attention, he's relentless because he loves you and he wants you in his kingdom. He wants to spare you from hell and give you eternal life with him in heaven. He loves you. And so if you want to receive the Son, I ask you to pray this prayer with me right now, right where you are. Dear Lord God, I believe that Jesus is the very Son of God and that I get to the Father through the Son. And so, Lord Jesus, I receive you as my Savior, the one who saves me. And I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I repent of all that I've done wrong. Lord, you know the long list. I can't remember them all. But wipe me clean and forgive me of my sin. And make me new. Make me fresh and clean. I receive you also as my Lord, the one who I place in charge of my life. I'm no longer going to be in charge. I take a back seat. Because you are Lord. And it will be my great privilege to follow you the rest of my days and to proclaim you to other people. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of eternal life that comes through Jesus Christ. Still in this moment of prayer, if you just prayed that prayer, would you, without any shame, would you hold up your hand high? Just prayed that prayer. There are those in this room. Yep. Wonderful. If you would all look at me at this time. For those of you who just prayed that prayer, I want you to do two things. When we're done with this service, I want you to go out into the lobby and you'll find a place called I Said Yes, which means I Said Yes to Jesus. I want you to go there because there'll be some people there that will, that will help you with what's next don't just go on your way, but this is the most important decision that you've ever made in your life. Go there. They're going to give you a gift. They're going to give you a brand new Bible because it's a special day, the day you gave your life to Jesus. And they're going to give you some basic materials on what, what it means to be a follower of him and what to do next. And they're going to celebrate with you what you've done. Secondly, tell somebody. Tell somebody what you have done. Tell somebody that you know is a follower of Jesus. They're going to be so thrilled with what has just happened in your life. Can we welcome those that just prayed that prayer in the family of God? Say this God. Yeah. I'm going to ask for our communion servers to go to the back and get ready to serve us. And what we do here at the table is all about what we just talked about. It's all about Jesus and the work that he's done for us on the cross, how he came on behalf of the Father and paid the price for our sin. He paid the price for our sin. The, the, the bread is the symbol of his very body that was broken. 
The, the juice is the very symbol of his blood that was shed for us. And he tells us to do this until he comes back again. So we'll never forget his loving sacrifice for us. I want us to take a few moments to have some individual time of prayer with God. Just between you and him. Before we get these elements. In this house of prayer to encounter God. So take this time to pray to him. Lord, we ask for you to minister to us through this time. For those things we need to get right with you, Lord, may we get those things right with you. Lord, may you hear from our hearts and our our lips, our, our gratefulness, our praise for what you've done as you've reached out to us and been patient, patient, and patient. Thank you for saving us from the penalty of judgment day. Although we didn't do anything to earn it or deserve it, it's a free gift from you because you love us. And so we thank you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. When you receive these elements, when you're ready as we worship, when you're ready, partake of them the cracker and the juice when you're ready between you and God. You partake of them while we worship. Thank you. Thanks.